getting to know the people around us at church is really important. And you might be saying to yourself, I don't go to that kind of church, like it's not a community. Community begins with me turning to the person next to me and saying, hi, my name is Lisa, what's your name? Welcome to Creating Our Holy Home. I'm your host, Jillian Hofer, and I am so excited to be speaking to the Catholic moms, the Catholic wives, the Catholic women who are trying to bring their families to heaven one small intentional thing at a time. I feel like one of the biggest kind of tropes about motherhood is that it is so hard and awkward to make mom friends. Like in this hugely variable and vulnerable stage of our lives where your kids are constantly changing, you're constantly changing and trying to make your house and your family and work and all of the different factors work. In the midst of all that, it's like, oh my gosh, when do I have time for friendships? And where can I find friendships that are going to understand the nuance of kind of what we're going through? And forgive me, frankly, when I don't text back for like two and a half weeks. (laughs) It's what every mom is thinking, right? And I feel like I heard so much, even around the idea of the lack of mom friends and community and the hardships of building that before I even became a mom. And I feel that now. Like, it is hard. Sometimes you meet a mom. And I remember reading uh, someone on Instagram a few weeks ago when I was scrolling was telling a story about like, oh my gosh, I I found this mom in the playground and our kids were playing really well and we got to chatting. And then at the end, it was like I was trying to ask her on a date almost and I totally chickened out. Like I couldn't even be like, can I just get your phone number? Can we be friends? (laughs) But this conversation is such a wonderful reminder that sometimes it really just is that easy. Um, I am chatting today with Lisa Hendy, and Lisa is the founder of CatholicMom.com and the best-selling author of books for adults and children, including The Grace of Yes and I'm a Saint in the Making. Her Chime Traveler series for kids is read and studied worldwide in homes and schools and churches. She's also a frequent TV and radio guest, and she has hosted two podcasts herself. Um, And she also speaks internationally on faith, family, evangelization, and technology. She also is just an amazing mentor and resource, especially to younger moms like myself. Like, I think you'll hear that come through in this conversation. Lisa just has such a heart for speaking to other mothers who are especially in earlier stages than she is. She is in the stage now where she has adult children and she has grandchildren. So she's just pouring out all of the wisdom that she has learned in the most like relatable, beautiful way. And a lot of that comes through in this episode. Um, We talk a lot about community building. We talk a lot about how to balance that kind of like online scrolling validation that a lot of us moms, or maybe it's just me, do. (laughs) Always look into like Instagram and Google to figure out questions that I probably should just be asking to other friends. Um, And also we talk about the vulnerability it takes to build community as moms. Um, She has some incredible advice for building that community and taking that step within your own life, no matter how much time you do or don't have. So I cannot wait for you to hear uh, the absolute joy and wisdom that Lisa has to share with us today. So enjoy. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us on the Creating Our Holy Home podcast. Oh, it's a treat. I'm so excited and really um, feel very blessed to be here. Oh, well, it's it's a joy to have you. I was telling you before we turned the mics on that Madison Cipolletti, who's my coworker, she's been on the podcast. She spoke with you a while ago before she went to Given Institute, and she immediately came to me. She said, Jillian, you have to have Lisa on the podcast. So I'm (laughs) so happy the day is finally here. Well, thanks for the the recommendation, Madison. And I'm just, I think it's so wonderful. Any chance to talk about being a mom is the best. Oh, it's the absolute best. So I'm having you on today because you are the founder of CatholicMom.com, which I feel like most people have heard about. I know I've heard about and I've read blogs from. So can you just tell me a little bit about kind of how CatholicMom.com came to be? <laughs> to be honest, Jillian, it's probably older than you are. Um, <laughs> probably, looking, honestly, looking at your is. age, I'm like, uh, we probably outlive many of your listeners now that are awesome <laughs> moms. Um, in the year 1999, so in the past century, um, my children were of an age, um, and I was, um, you know, preparing my first son to receive his first communion. I attended a, one of those parent meetings. If you have if you're a mom with kids that are in sacramental prep, you know that they bring the parents in and they tell you, 
you are the primary faith formator of your child. And um, at that time, while I had a really wonderful marriage, my husband, Greg, um, he was not yet Catholic. He since has come into the church. But um, at that time, that responsibility was on me. And um, I felt the weight of it. So I went home that evening after the meeting and started, there wasn't even really Google yet. I started Yahooing on my dial-up computer for, uh, you know, resources for Catholic mom and didn't find anything. And so somehow I just decided, like, there needs to be something for women like me. Not that I think I have the answers, but that I'm desperately seeking them, desperately seeking community, um, I'm desperately seeking to grow in my own faith. I had been raised cradle Catholic all the way from preschool through Catholic University at Notre Dame, but um, I just felt like I didn't have everything that I needed to pass along to my kids. And so I wanted to create, and what I did in 2000 was to create a, a simple website where we could come together and find those things. And I didn't do it because I thought I had all the answers. I did it because I was sure that there was a need of other women like me. And I mean, definitely the Holy Spirit and our Blessed Mother have been with us every step of the way. Oh my gosh, Lisa, I'm, I'm, so I have, uh, I'm still a fairly new mom. My daughter turns one this week. And um, I feel like the thing that you said that resonates so much is just moms looking for community. Yeah. And like, I have wonderful friends who are moms and friends who are not moms yet in their lives or won't be in their lives. And I still go to the internet so often just to be like, maybe I just need to look up something that I'm afraid to ask someone, or I just need a quick answer or whatever. That community aspect is just like, isn't it just something that every mom craves? Absolutely. And if you can imagine back then, I mean, this is like pre-social media, pre, you know, pre all the things that we think now I'd shoot off a quick text to a friend. We didn't really have those resources. And so, but there were these things called message boards were kind of a precursor to, uh, to social media and immediately with no, you know, no rhyme or reason. I'm pretty sure initially we had, even back in the day, the websites had these little things called hit counters. And it was like a little number down at the bottom of the page that you would see spin. And I, I remember seeing it hit a hundred and hit a thousand and thinking it's probably just me and my mom hitting it, you know, <laughs> 50 times each. But, um, you know, it, it was really clear by the growth of this um, this entity um, through no means. I mean, there was no advertising. There was nothing just but word of mouth, um, how quickly it grew, that there was such a need. And that need continues to exist. Technology has evolved. But the things that we're talking about, like, how the heck do I get my baby to sleep through the night? Um, you know, how can I possibly take this squalling little dear one to mass? Um, you know, all these things, um, it's still the same things that we're talking about now. It's it, motherhood is timeless in so many ways. And it is so interesting, like, especially speaking to you, who I know you have grandkids now. It's like yeah. so many of these articles that you say that you wrote early on. It's like, yeah, I still need these answers today. Right. None exactly. of that changes. So, Lisa, I know you running CatholicMom.com put you in this seat for so many years of, I'm sure, getting feedback from these women that you were writing for. Correct. It's amazing. I mean, and the very earliest kind of formal decision that I made was that this wasn't just my site. It was for anyone who wanted to participate. And so very early on, we invited other women to come and write. And it's still a hallmark of Catholic Mom that we have at this point close to 150 all volunteers that write for this site. So every day that you come, there are different things that you'll see and experience. But um, but yeah, it was um, it was really important that, you know, for me, that this be a place of daily kind of encouragement and just that a woman would know that she doesn't walk this journey alone. What are some of the topics that are kind of those timeless ones that just came up over and over and over again for you, Lisa, <laughs> as you were writing and editing for all the contributing blog articles? Like, what's the thing that women were just always needing more community and conversation around? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always a big discussion about, well, I don't even know if we still call it this, but the cry room syndrome, I'm going to say. The syndrome oh of God, having yes. having little ones. For me, I was taking these two little boys to mouse. My, my kids are three years apart, two sons, and um, you know, here I was just trying everything that I could to like get them to just sit still and be quiet. And I looked around myself and just despaired. 
that I thought, first of all, everyone is, looks different from me. There's, you know, I, I was blind to the people that were in my same situation. And all I saw was the woman whose husband was a Knight of Columbus who wore the matching tie with her three sons and everything was always perfect. And I just looked at myself and my, you know, first of all, I could barely brush my hair. And, you know, here are these two kids that are screaming for Cheerios. <laughs> <laughs> so like how do you get through that I think it's still and my encouragement always was I, I made the decision because someone encouraged me come sit in the front of the church um, not only will your children and you engage more but you're a witness by the beauty of your family being up there and people seeing you so um, that was always a big one another one is just you know anything to do with teenage years and how challenging those are and I don't profess to have any answers about um, any of this stuff other than just do your best and give it over to God and ask for help um, as you need it. A lot of people have always reached out to me um, when their um, spouse is not in the church um, because I've always been sort of open about our journey and um, how hard that is um, and yet how many blessings come as a result of it. And I can look at my path through life and say, it would have been entirely different had I not had my best friend, you know, um, on this journey with me. And his conversion to the church um, really created a profound um, conversion in me too. But when that doesn't happen and you're doing this alone, you know, what are the things that we can do to encourage and bless women that are in that situation? So some oh, of those God. things are just, you know, we didn't have to deal back in the day with what you do now with kids who have friends with cell phones in kindergarten or, you know, too many video games, but um, a lot of this stuff is still very timeless. Oh, Lisa, I, I'm sure that we have many women listening to this that probably are in the same spot that you were in back in 99 in the early 2000s of like, maybe they are the sole catechist of their house because their spouse either isn't catechized themselves or isn't Catholic. Uh, could you just speak to maybe the the that experience a little bit more for you of like what were what were those years like and what did community mean to you and how did you find that community in those moments I was really blessed that we um we had our kids in a catholic school that had a really mm -hmm. wonderful parish and that became an instant source of community for me but I also sort of idealized the women that I saw around me quite a lot you know um, there wasn't really, I know there's like drop off line now. We didn't have a drop off line back in the day. We got, we parked our cars and got the kids out and, um, running the gauntlet of going through the school parking lot was always a little bit of an insecurity for me because I, I really thought, you know, just everyone else had their act way more <laughs> together than I did. Um, but I think that, um, I don't know. I, I think that just learning to, first of all, to be humble enough to ask for help. I had my mom on speed dial all day long, every day, and I also have two sisters. So that was a huge thing for me. But I also had friends at our parish. And um, one thing that I did that I don't know how this happened, but I got very involved in the RCIA movement, which is now OCIA. Um, and long before my husband, Greg, was involved in it, my dearest friend at our parish was sort of the person who ran that. And I could go with to her with any big question and ask it. And I think finding that person, whether it's your pastor, and I do think too that while our priests are very busy and our religious sisters that are around us are all very busy, like go to them because they desire to have this relationship with the people that are their flock. And when we just reserve, you know, our talks with them for that quick moment of saying hi or, you know, during a time when we're in confession and there's 10 people in line behind us, like we, we short shrift not only ourselves, but them too. So getting to know the people around us at church is really important. And you might be saying to yourself, I don't go to that kind of church, like it's not a community. Community begins with me turning to the person next to me and saying, hi, my name is Lisa, what's your name? So, oh, and I, I still do that now. Oh, and it's so good. It's I, I think so often there's been um, there's a, a, you know, kind of Catholic influencer, which is a funny term, but a Catholic influencer that I follow on Instagram who posted recently kind of asking the question of like, oh, I was at the park with the kids. I saw this mom. 
we kind of struck up a conversation. I feel so awkward, but like, I want to be friends with her. And it's like, what yep. do I do? <laughs> and it's like, sometimes we just way overthink it of like, yeah, yeah. It's, you just literally put the phone down and you look and you say, hi, I'm Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a mom too. We, we moved um, from, we were living in Los Angeles when my first son was born and my husband, Greg, was a medical resident at the time. Um, he's an emergency medicine physician. On my 30th birthday, we moved um, to Fresno, California, which is a, was a big move at the time, four hours. Um, my son had chicken pox and I was oh. 30. I moved with a sleeping bag and a lawn chair and um, Greg came up a little bit later, but I remember putting Eric in the bathtub and having a hu super humongous pity party, like crying for about 45 minutes of his bath and then putting him down for a nap and going literally to, in the pre-internet days, going to the yellow pages and like looking up, like what are activities that I can be involved in in my town because I was so desperate for friends. And by the time he woke up from his nap, I had two things written on my little refrigerator calendar, two mother's activities that I could do the following week. And it was a lifesaver for me. And those friends that I had back then, that were the moms that I met at the playground when my husband was working all these terrible hours are still my best friends now. There's something about those friends that you make at that age. Um, when you go through the trenches with a, with a woman, you know, that um, they're just a gift. Oh, I, it's so funny that we're having this conversation now because I was just with my mom yesterday and we were talking about how we grew up very closely with another family. And it was, our dad, so my, my dad and then her husband worked together and they both traveled a lot. And so we just kind of combined forces. Like my mom told me, she was like, me and my best friend, Carolyn, became partners. When the dads were out of town, we became each other's partners. And we said, if you're tired for the day, I got the kids. If you're sick, I got the kids for the afternoon. I'll do carpool today. You do it tomorrow. Like it became like those weeks we were family. And my mom said she was like, there were so many years there in the trenches of motherhood that we would not have gotten through without each other and the community that we had built. And I'm like, gosh, it's just, it's so true. And I, I don't know why, but I do feel like being a young mom now, and I don't know if it's an effect of the social media generation or what, but like, we just are not building those communities as easily as we were before for some reason. Well, I think we're um, inundated with wonderful virtual resources that sometimes mm. take the place of that. We didn't have that back then. And so, you know, and my mom had the neighbors across the street, um, you know, with a cup of coffee in the middle of the cul-de-sac. And I mean, every generation finds their way. Certainly real valued relationships are made nowadays through virtual channels. I would never discount that. It's it's an amazing resource, but sometimes it takes us stepping out in courage and having the humility just to say, I really need some support in my life. And if you're the person who says that doesn't exist, then you maybe also need to be the person that goes to, you know, your church and says, gosh, can we have mom's group one day a week here at the parish and I will organize it. If you're waiting for your pastor to start mom's group, it's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> But if you say, you know, and maybe it happens on the playground or maybe it happens some, someplace nearby, um, but somebody's got to be the person that says this is really a need. And it, it's going to bear such beautiful fruit, not only in your own life, but for your parish community. When the moms come together, like powerful things happen in a community, especially if prayer is at the center of it. I joke, but I'm very serious about it, that most moms that I know could get as much done in a one hour time span as a lot of people <laughs> in about a five hour time span. We are powerful. Don't absolutely, tempt us. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And I think everybody is looking around for who's going to be the person that starts it. Um, and, you know, so maybe you don't feel like with a one year old, you can do that right now on your own, but you know, maybe you can find three other people at church that look just like you mm -hmm. and say, Hey, I've been thinking about this. Would be, would you be up for doing it with me? Yeah. And, and I think so much, Lisa, too, about like, for me, so much of that comes down to vulnerability and being willing, like you said earlier, to admit that, hey, I'm really struggling with this or, hey, I need help with this. D and you did you find the same to be true oh, when you absolutely. were in kind of the trenches of it? Absolutely. Yeah. And 
I think that, you, you know, just in a general sense, even at the age that I'm at now, asking for help and kind of humbling yourself is really hard. But we have this beautiful example of our, example of our Blessed Mother before us who, you know, when she found out what we read in scripture, you know, when she found out that she would be the mother of our Savior, one of the very first things that she did was go to her kinswoman, Elizabeth, and, and have this moment, you know, she was there for to be care, caring for her, but also to be nurtured in her own time of need. And so, you know, if it's good enough for Mary, it should be good enough for us too. Oh, amen. It's so, it's so amazing how in different phases of life you have kind of like different parts of those stories that you hear from our faith come yeah. to life. And like the visitation is one for sure that in motherhood for me has been like, oh man, it really is the women in our lives that we can go to with the joy and the sorrow and the hard and the deep and the heavy and all the things. I'm also consoled by the fact that she said yes, but she said yes, but what about, you know, yeah. here's all my questions. Like that makes the part of me that's terrified about a lot of things to say, okay, she had some like, okay, Lord, tell me what the heck. <laughs> so. We are through the centuries. The women are all the same. Thank God, right? Exactly. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So Lisa, I know we, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but like if there are women out there now who are maybe feeling lonely and overwhelmed and there is this easy kind of entry point, maybe online and in digital spaces, like if there's a mom that's going to catholicmom.com to kind of see articles and stuff, what do you think is a good kind of segue or a starting point into moving maybe some of the places like tendencies to go online for things to then moving it to like a community and vulnerability with other women in your life? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, you know, look for the older women around you in mass, you know, maybe you see, I'm 61 now, maybe you see somebody like me who I, it's ironic now I still sit in the pew by myself because my husband Greg does a music ministry at our parish. So I'm still like sitting there and I would absolutely love for some young, young mom who had really out of control kids to come sit next to me and just say, hi, what's your name? <laughs> Can Aww. you help me? So I think like, that's one thing, like you just never know um, with the, with the women that are sitting near you in a parish. Um, I think there are a lot of great kind of templates and resources, especially nowadays for women's um, faith sharing for women's Bible studies and things like that. A lot of things that are available where all it takes is gathering two or three of your friends. And, and honestly, maybe it does happen on Zoom or FaceTime to start out with because you just can't get it together to come in person. Um, I used to be very sensitive about not wanting to like invite people over to my house because I thought it's not that fancy and, you know, like it's really messy. But like, I think we need to get back to the age of my mom's friends who just had, you know, one thing that my mom had um, when I was growing up was rosary group and they, everybody would bring their kids. And it was like, you went to a different person's house every week. Some of the women didn't have kids. Um, it was for any woman who wanted to just come pray the rosary for half an hour, drink some coffee, commiserate. And um, like just getting back to things like that, like it doesn't have to be super fancy. Um, and maybe it's a book club, maybe it's, there's all kinds of venues to be something that comes together. And I think we need to remind ourselves, I'm not signing up to do this for the rest of my life. So maybe right now it's a really busy season, but can I do it for two or three weeks? Can I do it once a month? Can I do it, you know, like space it out a little bit. So I, I'll also say, Lisa, in my experience, I will, I have so many single friends and reaching out to those friends and the amount of support I've gotten as a mom from my friends who don't have children or are single is amazing because I mean, usually they have a little bit more freedom and flexibility yeah. than the moms who have young kids or kids of all ages. And it's like, I have found so much joy and I, I hope they found joy in like being a part of my family as well of just like inviting my single friends into the community as well. And I love what you said about the rosary group that it's like, it's just women gathering. Yeah, sometimes absolutely. there's kids running around and sometimes there are not kids running around, but like, there's just something about gathering of women together. And when you were talking about that, I was just thinking about how like there's, at least for me, sometimes there's a fear of like, oh, well, if I start something, you know, what if it's not quote unquote successful or what if only one other person yes. shows up and it feels awkward or whatever. And immediately I felt like God was like, where two or more are gathered in my name, 
then I am there. And it's like, that's all that you need. One other person to show up. And that's the beginning of a community. It's the beginning of church. And I want to mention specifically working mothers as well. Um, Single mothers, working mothers, um, adoptive and foster mothers, like everybody really needs this. And I I think I'm, I've been very blessed um, to work in and out of, you know, workplaces during my, my time and to have a lot of my work happen at home. But both of my sisters are sort of the breadwinners for their families. And um, I think it can be really particularly isolating Mm -hmm. um, to be in a work environment and try to find um, women to network with. And so this is a thing too, where I think we're, we're sometimes called to let down our guard a little bit in those places and to express some vulnerability um, to say, you know, maybe that you have a, a coffee date once a week, or maybe you sit together while you eat lunch or whatever it is, and you're not needing to find people that are absolutely in lockstep with you. Don't discount the blessing that an older woman can be in your life. I I love that so much, Lisa. I was thinking of Madison when you were saying that because Madison and I have the joy of we've been friends for years and then we happen to both be working at the same company together now and also happen to be mothers of young nursing children. So we aligned our pump times and we would we call them (laughs) pump chats. And I was like, oh, my gosh, it was such a like balm for the soul of. Oh, like just having another working mom, someone who got it, someone who was pumping at work, someone who's at the same company. Like it was such a wonderful time for us to just be vulnerable about what was going on, show each other pictures of how cute our kids were this weekend or complain about yes. how hard <laughs> things were because of this, that and the other, or our husband's out of town or whatever. It was just like the best time to have. And I think so often about like, man, you know, I'm sure other other moms that are maybe pumping or nursing or whatever, it's like, just call up a friend. You make Absolutely. that time the time that you connect because everyone's doing the same thing. Yeah. And that's sacred space, right? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Oh, Lisa, I, I would love to You can to call me if more. you need a nursing buddy. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I'm like, Lisa, also the what you said about younger moms seeking out more like moms in a later phase of their motherhood. That is so beautiful and so needed. And I think so often about like, I am so, so fortunate to have a close relationship with my mom, as you said that you did. And my mom lives 20 minutes down the road. She watches my daughter three days a week. So I see her and I talk to her every single day. And that is like, her perspective is so invaluable. And I know I'm sure that your kids feel the same way and any other young moms. That is something that it's like, okay, I need to just be more vulnerable, even with like the women around me in church of like, there's a family that sits behind us who her kids are like one just graduated from high school, her oldest did. And they're, they're just in a phase that it's like, they're, you know, two steps ahead of us. Yeah. And I'm like, I've got to get coffee with her because all her kids (laughs) are serving at mass in different ways. And they're so sweet. And they're playing with my daughter in the pew. And I'm like, Oh, I just have such a desire to like, connect with her and hear more from her because she's she's close to where I was but enough removed that it's like oh I could learn so much from her instead of being like intimidated you know absolutely and I think we forget that that's a gift for each person that's in that kind of spiritual friendship I feel so blessed um to be I mean I guess you might call it in mentoring relationships I'm not a formal coach or mentor or anything like that but I'm very blessed to have a lot of younger women in my life and I think that uh, sometimes younger women think oh well I'm going to use up some of their time or whatever, always remember that that's a two-way relationship Mm -hmm. and that the person that you're coming into a spiritual friendship with is equally as blessed by it as you are. Oh, I love that so much. And out of curiosity, Lisa, how do you get connected with young women that you kind of mentor or have that (laughs) spiritual friendship with? I mean, I'm, for example, I'm going to say right now, like, if you need somebody to chat with, like Lisa had at gmail.com is the way that you can reach out to me. And even if that's that you have a long distance pen pal, I spend a lot of time, you know, on zoom with women. Um, and I, I think that the Holy spirit just leads people into our path that we know. Um, and maybe those are friendships that last a long time. Maybe you chat once and don't ever talk again, but if I can be of encouragement to someone, I always try to, Uh, make time for that because it's a gift to me too. So, Oh, I'm tearing up just hearing you even (laughs) say that and like offer your email up like that, Lisa, because it is so clear that you are just in living in the 
strengths and the gifts that God has given you in that way. And like, just thank you. That's such a beautiful gift that you are giving young women and just kind of opening yourself up to those relationships. I can tell that you've blessed many, many women who are well, spiritual thank friends. You. You. Thanks for oh. saying that. But I feel like I'm far more often on the receiving end of it. And, oh you know, um, it's, it, it's funny how people that you meet, I can look at so many of my close friendships and see that it was somehow just that this person was put into my path. And I'm old enough now to be able to look back at decades long friendships like that and think, how did that happen? Like how, you know, and it's, I, I credit the Holy Spirit because um, I think, you know, if we, if we are open to that, if we're open to the gift of womanly friendship, it can come in, into our life in droves. But a lot of times we feel isolated and lonely and and young motherhood can be a time of that just because it's so physically demanding and mm. emotionally demanding and we often feel just very solitary so i just want you to know if you're listening to this that you don't walk this journey alone that there are people out there that love you and care for you and that what you are doing is so beautiful and value valuable and it has merit and worth Oh my gosh, Lisa, thank you for saying that, especially as a young mom. It's just so good to hear that. I And now I'm just sitting here and I'm like, well, I'm just going to take this time to ask you questions for my own advice because <laughs> <laughs> I have you, so I'm going to ask you. Something that I think about so much in this time of my life, in this stage of my life is young motherhood is, like you said, physically demanding. There are a lot of things I've had to say no to, even just because of like my nursing schedule with my daughter and just the fact that I'm working. It's like, Every waking moment that I'm able to spend with my daughter since I work and I'm away from her so much, I have a hard time like committing to be away from her on those precious nights and weekends that I have with her. So there's a lot of, I think, guilt that I have been dealing with of just like, gosh, I don't feel like I'm being a great friend to some of my friends who are not in the same phase as me. Is there a way to keep those friendships up or like, have you been on the receiving end of a friend who've been, who's been in those trenches? And like, is there a way to keep that going even when I don't feel I can give my 100? Oh, I think your instincts on this are absolutely the best. Um, and your instinct that, um, I guess one of the things that I speak about quite frequently, I wrote this book several years back called The Grace of Yes. It's all about, you know, giving a generous yes. But there's one chapter in that book that's called The Grace of No. And lately I've been doing quite a lot of speaking on that topic. Um, and it's really about discernment. Um, it's really about sort of what are, what are our greatest priorities. And one thing that I talk about quite frequently when I discuss this is, you know, when someone invites me to do something that's, you know, bigger than just, let's say, going to have a cup of coffee. If it's something that's going to involve an, a commitment of my time, I sort of have this three-phased approach that I go through. And um, the first is to check my other commitments. So check my calendar and see what else I'm committed to. Um, check with my primary vocation, which at this point in my life is my relationship with my husband. And I joke that we've been married for 38 years and I um, still have to remind myself that he's not a mind reader, right? That he doesn't just <laughs> automatically know when I say that I'm going to do something and just get it on his schedule. So check with him to see how he feels about it. And then the thir third thing is really to check my soul because a lot of times my calendar is open. Greg's like, yeah, totally. You should go for that. But I know when I take it to prayer that if I put one more little pebble on top of my rock pile, the whole thing is going to fall over. And so I you know, that'll often be the time that I just have to say, I just can't at this point. Um, no, and, and it's hard in relationship because especially for friends that aren't lockstep with us um, mm -hmm. in the same phase, we might think that, you know, we're letting them down. But I think the best thing in those moments is to be honest. And I use this little exercise when I'm speaking about this to say, you know, Let's, let's, Jillian, I'm going to ask you to, like, ask me if I can be in charge of the Bible study for women at, at your church. Just give me that. Ask oh, yeah. me that question. Lisa. Really kind of... Lisa, do you think that you could be in charge of the Bible study that's going to be happening at our church? Oh, Jillian, you are so kind. So let's see. Today is Monday. Um, I need to, let me check my calendar. I'd love to talk with Greg and, and just take it to prayer. So do you mind if I let you know, maybe like Thursday or Friday, is it okay if I get back with you then? Yeah, of course. Okay, great. Well, we'll talk later in the week. So did you notice that you didn't say, I hate you, you're stupid? <laughs> like, 
you're not going to be my friend anymore, right? No, my initial reaction was that's a very normal thing to say is like, yeah, let me check with the person that's most important to my life and my vocation and let me pray about it. It's a very <laughs> level thing. Yeah, but somehow we don't give ourselves permission to do that. Um, somehow we, you know, we think, well, first of all, we don't want to let any good opportunity pass us by because we're ambitious and energetic and we want to be involved in things and we want that opportunity. Um, but oftentimes, you know, it's really not what's best for our soul. Um, and so I think just giving ourselves permission to take a beat in those moments um, and to, you know, to know that we can love ourselves enough to, to say no sometimes. And in relationships, I think this is one thing where, so the first thing is just maintaining the continuity of a relationship. And that might be just that you're a busy working person, Jillian. So maybe once a week you think, oh, you know, I'm thinking of my friend, you know, Mary, who I haven't seen in a while. Maybe I'm just going to like take two seconds and send her a quick text and say, praying for you today. It doesn't have to be, you know, rocket science that we're doing to maintain friendships. But we also all know that we sometimes have those friendships that can be um, not holy friendships that can be manipulative or whatever. And I think we have to, again, love ourselves and those we're serving in our primary vocation enough to distance ourselves in those moments and to know that's okay, you know, if oh. we need to do that. So. Amen. The little text too, it's like, I think in my mind, I automatically jump to, well, gosh, I feel like I need to apologize since they haven't heard from me in a while. And it's like, yeah, even you're, you're giggling and shaking your head because like, no, I, I don't expect that from my friends. Like if I, right. if I had a friend who out of the blue I hadn't heard from, who texted me, hey, praying for you and thinking of you today, friend, I would be so touched. I would be so touched. So it's like, all right, I just got to apply that to myself. <laughs> yeah. Give ourselves some grace, right? And, oh and imagine that if you're on the other end of it. Absolutely. It, it's so helpful. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Okay. Now, the perfect segue. You were talking about a book that you've written. I know you're an author. Can you tell me a little bit about the books that you've written and maybe what you're working on coming up soon? Oh, God has a very funny sense of humor. So <laughs> I am so blessed um, to have written several books during my career and um, for books for, for adults, nonfiction. Um, I wrote a, a children's fiction series called The Chime Travelers. It's a five book series all about a brother and sister that travel in time and meet different Catholic saints and learn lessons from them. And um, then I've also written four children's picture books. Um, and so one thing that you and I were talking about um, before we got started recording was the fact that I'm very blessed to be able to do school visits these days. And one great gift of COVID was that it gave us Zoom. So I love doing school visits in person, but a lot of times I make those by Zoom and, and they're free. Um, it's half an hour. So if you're a mom who's listening and you've got little ones that are in a homeschooling group or that are um, at a school that might like to have an author come and read, um, drop me a note. Again, lisahendy at gmail.com and, um, and invite me. I love coming out to talk um, to little ones, to, to read my stories, but also to encourage them that we all have a storyteller within us. Um, so that's part of the work that I'm doing. And I, I'm also just um, freshly writing a new book that I'm doing with Loyola Press that'll be out sometime. I'm, I have a deadline and I'm, and thoroughly ensconced in writing it right now. So it's a great gift to see how um, God's working still through the work that I do. Oh, exciting. Well, we'll be following you closely, Lisa. Excited to yeah. see that book when it comes out. Um, so Lisa, this has been so wonderful. Thank you so much. It like, honestly, I'm like, I will be emailing you just to check in and say, <laughs> hey, during my pump chats, you'll be my new pump chat. Every I love while. it. I'll put you I in the rotation. Um, a question that I love to ask all the guests on this show, obviously creating our holy home is a podcast for Catholic women who are trying to get their families to heaven and make their homes a little bit more holy. What is something that you and your home right now are doing to just make it a little more holy with you and your husband? Yeah, holy, holy. This is such a funny question because I don't look at myself and think, wow, that's really holy. But <laughs> one thing that's been important in recent years, my mother-in-law, my own mother and father went to heaven in the last few years. So please pray for Pat and Ann. Um, but my mother-in-law who lives about an hour away from us was diagnosed with Alzheimer's um, a few years, 
about a year ago. And um, we have always had the great blessing of having her close enough to us that we can drive easily and go see her. But she's become the focus of our Sunday mornings. By nature of my husband's participation in music ministry at church, um, we go to Mass on Sunday evenings. And um, that took a little bit of an adjustment to have Mass happen on, on five o'clock on Sunday night, but it's actually become a great gift because we now spend our Sunday mornings with um, my mother-in-law, Norma, and she's still well enough to be in her home, but we go every Sunday morning and spend um, time making brunch for her, maybe taking her grocery shopping, go through going through the mail that she got that week. And um, sometimes I have found myself to be thinking, oh, you know, I have so much stuff I want to do. But it's like the Sabbath is such a gift and the Lord's Day is meant to be spent with our loved ones. And so what a gift that um, he and I can have this time together with her to really focus on her. And we have that hour drive as we're going over there to listen to music and to catch up on conversation. And it's actually really become a great um, part of our, our Lord's Day. Um, that it doesn't, it's not necessarily happening in my home, um, but it's embracing my family, which is what this is all about, right? So I'd say Sundays with Norma has become an awesome recent tradition. So Sundays with Norma sounds like it could be the title of a future book. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But, but it is, you know, um, I know that we're all feeling like, oh my gosh, there's like so, like all these you know, crafts that I should be doing and the whole liturgical calendar. And I'm not discounting any of that if that's you and you can, you know, bake your way through the uh, the saints feast days or whatever. That's so awesome. Knock yourself out. That's not me. And so I have learned to find holy where God puts me and to recognize that there's a beauty and dignity in any way that we give our lives over to the people that we love and the God who loves us. Oh, Lisa, what's holier than that? That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I I don't ask this question to any other guests, but I really would love to ask it to you just because I feel like this is such a wonderful audience for your expertise. If you just had one piece of advice for younger moms, what piece of advice would you give them? Well, first piece of advice would be to love yourself just as you are and accept yourself. But then secondly, remember that the praying that you do every day for your family your husband, your children, your extended relatives is the greatest gift that you give them. And so don't worry if you feel like you're falling short in other areas. Um, be a prayer warrior for those you love and recognize that God hears and knows the prayers of your heart, even that you're too busy um, or too tired or too forgetful to express out loud. Be everybody's prayer warrior, including praying for yourself. All right. Well, I'm crying, so we should probably end this now. So. <laughs> Lisa, thank you. This was such a gift of a conversation. I am so excited for everyone else to hear this in our audience. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. And God bless you and all of your listeners. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Creating Our Holy Home. This show is sponsored by Catholic Home Goods brand, Our Holy Home. And we'd love to offer you 15% off your first order. So head over to ourholyhome.com and use the code podcast at checkout. For more sustainable practices and tips to get your family to heaven, subscribe to our email list at ourholyhome.com slash subscribe. We'll be praying for you and your families this week, and we will be back very soon with more.